25 years ago, a young man was sent to these islands on the other side of the world to fight a war. He was caught up in the darkest day of the conflict and sights he can't forget. A quarter of a century on, he returns to face those memories as he relives a soldier's story. I always remember leaving the islands and thinking I'd never want to come back to this place again. I think it was very important that I did come back. The memories are very clear. A lot of horrible stuff happened, you know, and you never forget them days. Falklands veteran Phil Stant has flown 8,000 miles to return to the South Atlantic. This British territory near Argentina is half the size of Wales and sparsely populated. But who owns it has been disputed for centuries. And I look round to the left hand side and in the distance you could see two little dots moving at such a rate before anybody could do anything. They were right on top of you here. Phil's journey will take him back to the bay where the supply ships Galahad and Tristram were hit. And the bravery. Phil pays tribute to his old enemy at the Argentine cemetery, saddened by the way their own country has forgotten them. I don't know who you was, son, but you've got me total respect. Hello. After 25 years, he's reunited with the couple that took him in after the war. How are you? I always remember coming here that first night, knocking on your door, and when Bill said, do you want some mutton? <laughs> then I knew. And the soldier turned professional footballer swaps the battlefield for the football field. I can't believe I'm 44 years old. I'm going to get the first international cap for the Falkland Islands. The Falklands are a bleak outpost between Argentina and Antarctica, once part of the whaling industry, now a gateway to the South Pole for scientists and tourists. In 1982, the islands were largely forgotten when, without warning, Argentina invaded and claimed them as their own. Britain sent a task force to recapture them, and suddenly the Falklands were world headlines. 19-year-old Phil Stant had just joined the army. If you recognize his name, it's as a football hero rather than a war hero. But his sporting ambitions were on hold as the fleet set sail, with Phil's unit aboard the QE2. It seemed like the start of a big adventure. The dockside was absolutely packed with people who were waving loved ones off. There were thousands of troops cramming onto this ship. It was like a, another exercise, if you like, because I think we'd been told that the war would be over by the time we get there, and we were just going down as part of a garrison force for after the war had finished. But the further on we sailed south, the more we realised that it wouldn't be finished by the time we got there. By the end of April, 65 ships were heading south, carrying 15,000 men including a landing force of 7,000 Royal Marines and soldiers. It was the biggest such operation since World War II. At the other end of the world is a stretch of water known as San Carlos Bay. This was the destination for the task force, soon to be renamed Bomb Alley, as Argentine aircraft attacked the British fleet. Sheffield smoking in the distance. HMS Sheffield, that is. We'd all heard about this notorious place called Bomb Alley. You would listen to it on the QE2 as you came down on World Service. But once you actually docked in there and you, you dropped the anchor, it was a ner nervy two or three hours waiting to get off. Uh, knowing what had happened in previous weeks in that stretch of water. Well, this is where the forces landed. 
This is where they came ashore on the jetty behind me. Uh, we were brought around through Bomb Alley on a, a landing craft and then everybody piled onto the jetty and made the way ashore. The first thing was, you know, we'd, we'd obviously heard about the skilled Argentinian pilot, so everybody was thinking, right, where am I going to get my head down here? So fortunately, there were some trenches already made, what the commandos had dug when they first landed, so straight away <laughs> we made a, a beeline for them so we could get our heads down there. It was quite funny actually, uh, it, it, it did make me chuckle that we walked up towards the shed, uh, whether it was a para or commander I'm not sure, but uh, somebody had chalked up there, last stop before Goose Green. The tiny settlement of Goose Green was the site of the first land battle of the conflict. Argentine troops took the hundred or so villagers prisoner in the community centre and had dug into the surrounding hills to await the British. At the time of the battle, we were still on the QE2 near in South Georgia. You look around and you, you, you're wondering what these paras were thinking as they were attacking Darwin Hill. I think my biggest memory initially of combat was the complete confusion. In training, you know which direction you're attacking, you know who's on your left, who's on your right. But when you come under fire and you're returning fire and you may have walked past a position that hits you from a flank, and you start returning fire that way, it amazed me how quickly you can become disorientated. Due to the terrain, our own mortar men couldn't keep up with us to give us artillery fire. The weather out at sea where the ships were, the weather was that bad that we couldn't get air cover, the Harriers, etc., couldn't come over to us. And we had one naval uh, gunship that came in to give us uh, covering fire. Unfortunately, it fired, I think it was HMS Arrow, I think it fired one or two rounds and it's gun jammed and so we were without that as well. There was an Argentinian, I say stronghold, there was about six or eight of them in a, a small hut. They produced a white flag to surrender and Lieutenant Barry, Corporal Sullivan and a couple of other people went forward to accept the surrender. When they got within about 15, 20 yards away, the Argentinians withdrew. The white flag produced a general purpose machine gun, GPMG, and shot them. When you do get hit, it's not like the film, um, if a round from a machine gun or a rifle hits you in, in the arm or the leg, it doesn't make a nice little hole. And, you know, you put a plaster on it, it can take your whole leg off. Um, without getting too gruesome, but the people I, I have seen die there. It, it's not like on the films where you're talking to your best mate as you're dying, sharing a cigarette, saying, tell my wife and my children I love them. Unfortunately, the people that I saw die, the majority, if they weren't killed instantly, there's a, a lot of pain, obviously, involved. And, you know, it, it's not like it is on the movies at all. Nothing like it. Two para lost their commander in the battle. Lieutenant Colonel H. Jones was shot as he charged up a ridge to expose enemy machine gun positions. The Argentines surrendered a couple of hours later. After the battle, watching the, the Argentines running in to Goose Green itself from the battlefield, and then the surrender, it was the best sight was the people that came out from the community center because we didn't really know how many people were in the community center we didn't really know how they take to us and they came out and they were union jacks flying and they were telling us to sit down and making coffee and tea and they were really pleased that we'd come back at san carlos the british fleet was still taking a hammering from argentine aircraft Many bombs failed to explode because the planes were too low when they dropped them. Royal Engineer John Phillips was with the team defusing the bombs. My war started and ended in San Carlos. We were aboard HMS Argonaut the day before defusing bombs on her. and We managed to get her going again. But on Sunday we were tasked to HMS Antelope, who had a similar problem. She had two unexploded bombs on board. One had gone in the port bow, one had gone in the stern, and um, she was crippled. They made five attempts to defuse the bomb, which was highly unstable, and then it went off. Jim Prescott and I were only about 30, 40 feet away from it in a direct line, but there was two bulkhead doors between us and the bomb. However, it was the bulkhead doors that were ripped off in the blast. Jim was standing right next to me, 